For most teams, Formula One is a means to an end. It's advertising. Win on Sunday, sell on Monday. Mercedes sells luxury cars, Ferrari sells sports cars, Red Bull, they sell Red Bull. So what does Williams sell? They sell nothing, they just race. Unlike most teams, they're not trying to win only so you'll buy something. They just want to win. Unfortunately for them, they haven't been doing that in a very long time. So why is one of the most successful F1 teams ever on a decades-long losing streak? Well, I think I figured out why. And it's all because once upon a time, Williams was simply too good. And today, we're going to look at the car that made them too good. Let's go. Thank you once again to our friends over at Amaze for sponsoring today's video. Amaze, they're always giving you a chance to win the car of your dreams. Kind of like this one right here. That's right, one of you has the chance to win this custom 1970 Chevrolet K5 Blazer restored by Ring Brothers with taxes and shipping included. This classic Blazer has been crafted with one of a kind parts and unique features from its vintage inspired dash to those custom HRE wheels. Under that carbon fiber hood, you'll find a growling LS3 6.2 liter V8 making 430 horsepower. And that's paired with 33 inch General Grabber tires. I got an LS1 in my catfish. You got an LS3 in your blazer. We can be freaking LS brothers. Put it there, man. So for your chance to win this custom 1970 Chevrolet K5 blazer, go to omaze.com slash donut. And best of all, Every donation supports Team Rubicon and the Veterans Coalition for Vaccination. They work in aiding local and state officials and other partner organizations in distributing the COVID-19 vaccine nationwide. So what are you waiting for? Hurry on up. Go to omaze.com slash donut to donate today and good luck. If you win, come, come pick me up. I'll be your Matthew McConaughey side buddy. All right, all right, all right. Way back in 1993, Williams built the most high-tech F1 car of all time, the FW15C. It had an automatic clutch, built-in telemetry sensors, a drive-by-wire throttle, pneumatic valves, driver-selectable power steering, and a mess of computers, all designed to produce faster laps than their competition. Those high-tech features are commonplace in F1 today, but three decades ago, racing was still pretty analog, and Williams and their FW15C pushed F1 into the digital world with their NASA grade engineering. They were the Jetsons and the rest of the grid, they were Flintstones. <laughs> William! All that innovation helped Williams win the 1993 Constructors' Championship with twice as many points as the second place McLaren, cementing their position as the standout team of the early 90s. But the nail that stands out often gets hammered down and Williams got hammered hard. The FIA saw the dominance of the Williams car and knew the competition would take years to catch up. So for 1994, they banned Williams' most innovative features, including analog brakes, traction control, and active suspension. The FIA was so afraid of Williams engineers that their unique continuously variable transmission was banned after testing. It never even saw a race. So what made all these high-tech features so great? Well, each of them solved a specific problem faced by every Formula One team. An F1 car from any era is a twitchy little beast that requires precision to get every last drop of speed without crashing. Unfortunately, not all drivers are created equal, and for every Lewis Hamilton, there's a Nikita Mazepin. Oh, Mazepin burn! Sorry, Mazepin, you get double lapped, you get roasted, roasted on, on B2B. B2B. You guys don't like Mazepin, hit that like and subscribe button. But even for Hamilton, driving at the absolute limit of grip for an entire Grand Prix demands a huge amount of energy and concentration. Getting tired or distracted, and you might exceed the tire's level of grip and lose control. That's when analog brakes and traction control come in to save the day. Just like a modern road car, the FW15C's ABS system use speed sensors and computers to detect when a wheel has stopped rotating while the car is still in forward motion. This happens when a driver misjudges the amount of grip available and uses too much brake pedal. 
The ABS computer intervenes during a lockup and reduces the total braking force. It does this by pulsing or rapidly applying and releasing the brakes. You might have felt this in your own car when you're panic braking to avoid an accident or trying to stop on ice or snow, or when you're trying to avoid hitting a possum in the road. <gasps> no, Pepper, no! Oh, Pepper. Mm. I have a pet possum, his name's Pepper. What's up? He actually died. <laughs> <laughs> Reducing the total braking force allows the wheels to rotate again, and then the tires regain traction so they can slow or turn the car. Without ABS, locked up tires just slide in whatever direction the car was traveling, often sending it straight off the track. You can see here in this car, the wheels are actually turned. The driver doesn't want to go where he's heading. But without ABS, that patch of tire continuously keeps skidding and the car pushes forward. You've seen this in F1, I'm sure, and that's part because the FIA doesn't allow ABS. Traction control, it's in a similar boat. It has speed sensors and computers that detect when a wheel is rotating too fast for the car's overall speed. This happens when a driver misjudges the available grip and uses too much throttle pedal, spinning the wheels. In a rear-wheel drive car like an F1, the spinning rear tires will have less grip than the front. You do that while turning and the car can oversteer into a spin. If they had traction control, the computer would intervene when it detects wheel spin, reducing throttle input and slowing the wheels so the tires can regain traction and the car can safely accelerate. Now, under ideal conditions, a top level driver can outbrake and out accelerate even modern ABS and traction control systems. But again, trying to maintain that level of precision for 70 laps with zero mistakes is a challenge. The FW15C's ABS and traction control meant Williams drivers could push harder for longer than their competition. These systems also meant that the drivers could charge over slippery surfaces like curbs or even grass, taking aggressive lines with less risk. But the FIA, they didn't like these fancy schmancy nerd systems. They thought this would permit subpar drivers to achieve undeserved success while computers took care of the actual driving. Obviously that's not true since Mazepin is still in there, but the FIA wanted the best drivers to win races, not the best engineers and programmers. So in 1994, they banned all electronically controlled driver aids, including ABS and traction control. <laughs> Have you ever dreamed of a world where cars and ideas create vision? Vision, vision, create vision. Where collectibles are not only collected, they are felt. Felt, felt. Introducing the latest innovation in cars and collectibles. Stocky. Stocky is a first of its kind designer collectible, the ultimate gift for a car nerd and an officially licensed Acura product. So turns out that creating a collectible is not easy or cheap. It's been a very long process, but we're really stoked with how it turned out and we hope that you guys are too. Just like everything with Donut, the only way that this is successful is through you guys. I mean, you guys are the only reason we're anything at all. So we're launching this on Kickstarter. We wanted to make something the perfect size to display on your desk, next to your TV, in your dorm room, in the shop, wherever. We explored a ton of different deformations before finally landing on this, something that we think is the perfect mix of fun and stylized while still staying true to to the original car. Speaking of the car, for Stocky 001, we knew that we had to go with one of the most iconic and legendary tuner cars of all time, the DC2 Integra Type R. We're launching this in a bunch of sick different colorways, everything from OEM finishes like Phoenix Yellow, authentic Honda Championship White, and Nighthawk Black Pearl, to crazy versions like Primer Gray, Glow in the Dark, Translucent. We're even gonna make a gold one, like actual gold from the ground. You only got two weeks left to get the launch edition Get yourself a stocky. Get your friend a stocky. Let's take it to the moon, baby. But the FIA really may have overestimated how much work these computers were doing. This was 1993, not a golden age of computing. I didn't even know computers were around in the early 90s, but I wouldn't know because I was not born yet. I was born in 2001. Calculate that and you know my age. You're welcome. The first Pentium processor had just been introduced and operated at 66 megahertz, or about a tenth of the speed of the first iPhone. In a car regularly exceeding 160 miles per hour, early computer-controlled systems had a hard time keeping up. 
So Williams made them driver selectable. A little wheel spin is sometimes faster and good drivers know this. It was still up to the driver to know when the system should be turned on to produce better results or left off. But the success of the FW15C was largely due to a much more sophisticated feature than its ABS and traction control, a computer controlled active suspension. These are shocks. A passive suspension uses mechanical springs and pressurized shock absorbers that have the same spring rates, dampening force, and ride height under all conditions. Because F1 cars encounter a wide range of speeds, corners, and surfaces during a Grand Prix, a passive suspension setup is always a compromise. They're designed to do an okay job of dealing with that range of conditions, but not optimized for every one of them. They're jack of all trades, but a master of none like our editor, Kanan, but he's not a master at one thing. <laughs> With an active suspension, computers detect bumps, body movements, and vibrations, and adjust the suspension settings on the fly to those best suited to the immediate conditions. Now Lotus, they were the first to experiment with active suspension by adding components on top of typical shocks and coral springs. But the extra weight of the hydraulics and mechanical actuators, plus the computers and sensors and all that good stuff necessary to make it all work, it wasn't worth the trade-off and Lotus abandoned the idea. But Williams, oh no, they were determined. And their FW15C's active suspension replaced the traditional shocks and springs with active hydro pneumatic cylinders that weighed just about the same. Now having a separate cylinder at each corner meant drivers could maintain control in circumstances that would upset an ordinary passive suspension. That's because each wheel suspension response could be adjusted independently. So for example, if a driver cut across a curb on a hard turn, the suspension's computer would keep the outside suspension firm to reduce body roll while simultaneously softening the inside to absorb the impact and maintain grip. Now watch Formula One today and you'll see cars briefly up on two wheels or even airborne from curb impacts like these, occasionally leading to something called an accident. You could potentially avoid all these type of crashes with an active suspension system, making for faster and safer racing. But because of the FW15C's dominance, the FIA banned these systems in 1994. Was it because active suspension is another form of electronic driver aid like ABS and traction control? Well, no. Active suspension was banned because it violated a rule from 1969, which prohibited movable aerodynamic parts. Since the 1969 ban on movable aerodynamic parts, lots of attempts have been made to overcome the trade-off with aero parts that react differently in different conditions, and that continues today. Red Bull, they were just criticized a few weeks ago for having a rear wing that was too bendy. The only movable aerodynamics currently legal in F1 is DRS. That's the system that opens up the rear wing for a boost of speed when a car is attempting to pass. The FW15C did not have movable aerodynamic parts per se though. What it did have was a push to pass function that created an effect a lot like DRS. Let me explain. On a high speed straight, a Williams driver could press a button on the steering wheel that lowered the rear suspension. That adjusted the pitch of the entire car, which flattened the angle of the rear wing, reducing its drag for better acceleration and speed. That button was also linked to the ECU, which would temporarily increase the red line by 300 RPM. The decreased drag and extra power gave the FW15C a huge edge when passing other cars, but because it did this by changing the aerodynamic profile, the FIA banned it based on that. The final innovation that proved Williams engineers were simply too good was their continuously variable transmission or CVT. That transmission was such a huge improvement, it was banned by the FIA before it even saw a Grand Prix. So what makes a CVT so great? Infinite gears. There are a lot of infinite things that I'd like. Infinite lives, infinite chocolate, infinite, you know what? <laughs> But infinite gears, why would you want that? Well, suppose your engine makes 200 horsepower at 6,000 RPM, but at 1,000 RPM, it probably makes about 10 horsepower. That's because every engine has a power curve and maximum power only happens at one specific engine speed, usually close to the rev limit. Now, imagine you're doing a zero to 60 acceleration test. When you begin accelerating, you're at 1,000 RPM, so you've got 10 horsepower. But just before first gear runs out at 40 miles per hour, the engine is finally spinning at 6,000 RPM. And for a sweet moment there, you've got all full 200 ponies. So what happens when you go to upshift a second? 
the revs drop down to 4,000 RPM and the horsepower drops to about 100 before gradually climbing back up and making maximum power again right at 6,000 RPM just before 60 miles per hour and then you shift again. You see what I'm getting at here. In the acceleration test, your 200 horsepower engine is only making 200 horsepower at two specific speeds, 40 miles an hour and 60 miles an hour. Now, every car using a normal transmission with just a handful of gear ratios is like this, including F1 cars. For each gear, there's just one specific vehicle speed where the engine is making maximum power. The rest of the time, nearly all the time, the engine is producing less than that. But what if you could somehow infinitely adjust the gear ratio? then you can make maximum power all the time. And that is exactly what a CVT does. Instead of using metal gears of various sizes to create small number of fixed ratios, a CVT sends power from the engine to the wheels using a belt and two pulleys. Each pulley is made from two cones that move closer or further away from each other, effectively increasing or decreasing the pulley diameter. The difference between the effective diameters of each pulley determines the ratio of engine speed to wheel speed. Since that difference can vary infinitely between the minimum and maximum values of those pulleys anyway, that means that the wheel speed can increase or decrease while engine speed remains constant. A driver in an FW15C with a CVT transmission, they don't have to compromise horsepower by selecting a few set of gears. With a CVT, they have an infinite number of gears, so it's one less choice that they have to make. Now instead, the driver can pin the engine at 13,000 RPM when it's producing its maximum 780 horsepower and use all of that power at any vehicle speed. The CVT manages changes in wheel speed by adjusting the pulleys to change the effective gear ratio, leaving the engine free to stay spinning at any speed the driver wants. And as an added bonus, the driver never has to shift gears, something that also slows a car down. Now, Williams only tested their CVT twice before the FIA created a rule requiring all cars to use a set number of fixed gear ratios. So what the heck, FIA? Why did you ban this sweet innovation? Well, officially, they feared that such a huge engineering change would contribute to rapidly increasing costs as Williams competitors would have to spend tons of research and development to catch up. Oh, booty hootie. Now, unofficially, it was rumored that a Williams car with a CVT was turning laps several seconds faster during testing than one with an ordinary transmission. So the million dollar question is, how did all these bands affect the Williams F1 team? At first, it wasn't too bad. Williams engineers, they kept working and building winning cars, even if they were a little boring compared to the FW15C. They managed to claim a few more constructors championships, bringing their total to nine, the best in the world at the end of the 90s. But since then, the standout F1 teams are the ones with the biggest budgets. Mercedes, Ferrari, Red Bull, they have won every season but one for the past two decades. Braun in 2009. Unlike Williams, all three of those teams have huge amounts of income at their disposal. Each of them spent more than $400 million in 2020. That's three times that of what Williams can afford. Meanwhile, Williams has finished dead last the last three years in a row. So is that it for Williams? Is all hope lost for that team? Well, maybe not. See, the FIA, they hammered down on Williams back in the 90s because they were afraid races would be won by the best car and not by the best driver. Nowadays, the FIA is worried its biggest budgets teams will win races, so they've implemented new spending caps for 2021. That cap, 145 million, which is just about what Williams can't afford. So what do you think in 2022? Is Williams gonna, are they gonna, they gonna be better? I hope so. I'm sick of seeing Mercedes win all the time. God dang it, it's the same freaking car winning all the time. It's like me playing tennis against Kanan. He got freaking smoked. He's not gonna code this on here, but he should. It would be the right thing to do. <laughs> Donut is looking for new co Sorry, can you go back to the beginning? You guys, Donut is looking for new hosts. Do you love cars? Do you know how to work on cars? Do you have a potentially unhealthy desire to be the center of attention? Perfect, then go here or click the link in the description below. We're looking for the funniest person in the pit crew, the most hilarious person in the shop. If this is you, submit to be a host. If this sounds like someone you know, encourage them to submit to be a host. The last time we did this, we met both Zach Job and Jeremiah. Thank you guys so much for watching my audition. Hello, Donut Media. My name is Zach Job. You could seriously 
be next. So go ahead and click that link or send it to a friend and let's make videos about cars together. Goodbye. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Bumper to Bumper. Follow me on Instagram at Jeremiah Burton. Follow us on Donut here at Donut Media. Until next week, bye for now.